Hey, I'm Joe McLeod. This is the Service Design Show, and this is episode 207. Think about the last time you had to break up with a service that you used to enjoy. Maybe it was a streaming platform with a dwindling library or a gym that kept raising its membership fees. All too often, the way you end your relationship with a service isn't the best experience, right? What most companies don't seem to realize is that poorly designed endings damage customer loyalty. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. In this episode, we will explore how to design positive goodbyes that leave a lasting impression and maybe even keep your customers coming back for more. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push our businesses forward, and honor our planet. For the past 15 years, our guest Joe McLeod has been a disruptor in the customer experience game. He has worked with some of the world's biggest brands transforming their customer journeys and driving millions in revenue and loyalty. We have been living in a world of abundance where lost customers were easily replaced. But in today's more competitive landscape, simply acquiring customers isn't enough. Joe argues that companies should spend just as much time and energy designing endings as they do crafting onboarding experience. That might sound counterintuitive, but according to Joe, well-designed endings can be the key to turning a churning customer into a loyal brand advocate. In this episode, we'll question the traditional customer journey model and explore how to design positive endings that leave a lasting impression. And don't worry, our conversation won't be just theory. Joe shares practical ideas and actionable steps you can implement today to design more positive ending experiences for your customers. We'll move beyond the traditional hyper-focus on customer acquisition and dive into the often overlooked offboarding stage. We'll explore how endings are fundamentally different from beginnings and what this means for the service design process. Joe shares real world examples of companies who are doing endings well and the characteristics that make their goodbyes stand out. And finally, you'll hear why endings have been overlooked for so long and why now is the perfect time to leverage their power. A part that really resonated with me in this conversation was when we talked about endings as moving through a graduation. Of course, endings happen when a customer stops using your service. But when you think about it, endings actually happen in every stage of the customer life cycle. They are the important transitional moments which can be designed. You can celebrate that your customer is ready to move on to the next maturity stage, even if this means they will stop using your service. Oh, and as a heads up, you might want to stick around to the end of our conversation for a chance to win a signed copy of Joe's book. We've kept the entry process extremely simple. So yes, even you have a shot at winning. I hope this got you excited to explore the fascinating world of endings. And please join me for a great conversation with Joe McLeod. I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hi, delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Mark. It's uh, um, it's such a privilege uh, in general to be a white dude, as many people tell me, but also to run a podcast and be able to pick the brains of uh, very smart individuals like you. And we've been hovering around each other in the same scene for a very long time, but never got a chance to actually meet. So I'm happy that this is finally happening. 
Yeah, we have loads of common friends, I think, but have never met. So, yeah, I'm really happy to come on here and heard a lot about the podcast in the past and listen to it occasionally. But, yeah, really, um, and uh, congratulations on getting to 207 episodes. Yes, just keep on doing the same thing over and over and over again every two weeks. Then at some point you reach that number. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Joe, you are all about endings these days, aren't yep. you? Uh, that's uh, pretty much all I do. So, and it's pretty much all I've done nearly for 10 years. So um, I've been looking into this for a long time now and uh, I'm an evangelist uh, and I'm happy to talk about endings until the end of time. <laughs> um, I have two questions and I'm trying to figure out where should we start? So maybe let's start with a very short definition. Endings, what are we actually referring? What are you referring to? Of course. So um, obviously there's endings for everything. Everything ends eventually. The sun's going to burn out and the, it will consume the earth eventually. So I've, the first book I wrote, 20, um, it was just 2017, the Ends book, that really laid the foundations and it looked at all sorts of endings. And I looked in a big philosophical aspect of that. But um, then digging into that, I've very much focused down on to now, I just focus on consumer offboarding experiences. And I consider that the important part of things, mainly because we're doing such a lot of damage into the earth. And it's, in my mind, it's the most important place to problem solve now. So consumer offboarding experiences All right. is where we're at. Yeah. So not... Not the end of the galaxies, but consumer no. of water. <laughs> I'm when when I was thinking about this, I was really intrigued and curious about why does somebody become so obsessed about endings? Can you take us on the journey that you went through that made you arrive to where you are today? Sure. So, I mean, like many of the people probably listening to the podcast, I have a background in broadly product creation. I My first degree was in design. My second degree was in interaction design. So getting into more the techno technology of it. And um, in all sorts of fields of design, we're basically using our creative skills to provide an emotional meaning or feeling around a product and that is essentially focused on selling that and making it a good product and so it took me ever such a long time to come to the end of that and so my journey is very much through doing endless work around selling and making great products and to a point of thinking wait a minute I think there's something else here and and once I started unraveling that and that crack opened of seeing how important endings are, it was, um, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a moment. You're stepping uh, uh, quickly over this, but there must, there must have been something that you saw or that happened that made you go like, hmm. And because I'm also sort of part of the design community, but endings have never sort of become my passion. So what happened to you? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And, and really, it comes down to what is a question and the, the philosophy of framing the question. You hear a lot of people about asking the right questions. And it took me ages to ask the question about why we don't do endings coherently enough to step into this. And way back in 2003 or four. Um, I was I run a short course at St Martin's in London, the design school, and it was about waste and rubbish in the world. And everyone went off and made their solution to the design problem. And they'd all created new things like marketing, marketing things like a pencil that says, don't waste resources or a mug saying, you know, save the environment. But they're philosophically so wrong to the question of waste and rubbish in the world create something else. And that it, at the time I was really confused and baffled. It just felt really philosophically wrong, but I didn't have the vocabulary to um, really talk about what I meant 
and what I felt about how big a problem that was. And basically, that's what I've been doing over years is building a vocabulary to explain the problem space. And, and that's very much the first book is ends is why don't we design endings? And that's, uh, that's quite a valid question. Um, somebody might say, you know, um, offboarding, we're not designing that. So what? Uh, to put it pretty bluntly, what's, what's your response to that? Uh, absolutely. And that, that's what we've been building over centuries is a system which has onboarding and usage provided by, uh, by a, a commercial company. And they will put a product into existence and the consumer will then fuel or pay for that product. And then, and then in partnership, you'll, you'll put this product into existence, the provider and the consumer. And then the state, after the user has finished that relationship with the product, the state then takes over and it's a very different vocabulary. It's a very different, um, language we use and and that sort of relationships been going on for well centuries pretty much and, th and this also works for digital and physical service products so it's not obviously this is a service pro podcast and it i think it's really important to look at this as a consumer experience problem because we're doing exactly the same thing in digital that we've done in services that we've done in physical and so that thin line across all of them and so if you're a business and thinking, why don't we deal with the end? Um, I, I think that the state and society have often picked that up. And, and over decades, we've dealt with it by throwing it in big landfill things in the sea. We, I mean, that was an organized process of so throwing stuff in the sea. Now we ship problems over overseas to be dealt with in terms of um, physical products. But we can also see like, you know, you ship, other things overseas in terms of the fallout of um, service products. So with, um, with debt, for example, 2008 financial crash, if you look at that very bluntly with um, onboarding usage and offboarding, there's no one gave a monkeys about the offboarding of those, um, those real estate deals back then. So um, yeah, this problem goes on all over the place. But in terms of what businesses should be looking at, in terms of endings is, um, and I talk about this on the website, like seven different reasons to think about endings as a business. One of the first ones is business risk. Businesses are really proud of um, believing they have all the knowledge about their business. And they, and they really do about targeting people, onboarding people, people in usage of that service. And then very little about the aftermath, the consequences, the leaving, the offboarding of that service. And the, that space is an opportunity space for brand equity as well. The drop in brand equity as a consumer leaves uh, many of the relationships we build is absolutely atrocious. I mean, if you look at um, a good example of that is the uh, leaving experience of um, signing up for things like cable channels or mobile phone contracts, you'll find loads of people having a horrible time of leaving a business. And what's that done to the brand equity that you've put so much money into uh, onboarding and usage? We care so little about brand equity or offboarding, and it permanently neutralizes any effort that you've made. One might say um, when someone stops paying for our service, brand equity isn't important anymore. Um, I don't think I agree with that, but uh, like we're very focused on the, the moment, up to the moment that we can send a check, an invoice to uh, customers. Absolutely. Um, I always, I think of a really interesting sort of thought experiment is like, if you're, if you're sending people away from your business like let's say a phone contract and you try and talk them around for an hour which there's lots of companies who try and do that you have to leave by having a one hour sales interview with a professional salesperson there's a lot of people who are quite vulnerable and will find that offboarding really overwhelming but the negative experience of that in the aftermath is going to be awful but if you spent let's say 50 $50 or 50 euros on 
a token for that person to just give away to one other person, you're going to get a happy new customer instead of spending money creating a bad uh, feeling in the memory. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, that you have seven reasons uh, why businesses might care about endings. Sure. So um, another one's like legislation. There's been loads of legislation that's come around in the last sort of 15 years. So if you think about things like uh, the WE Directive, which is the Consumer Electronics Directive from the EU, uh, that's a, basically a really coherent ending in the back end of the, of the electronics industry. You can take a product back uh, at the end of that life to any reseller. But no one knows about that. The consumer experience is invisible of that piece of legislation. Same with thing, things like um, the seven-day switch in the UK, which was a piece of legislation for banking. Previous to that, um, people had stayed at their banks for 23 years on average. And uh, so you would stay with your bank almost trapped there because the functionality of uh, leaving a bank was so difficult. So they had to introduce legislation into it. And then people started leaving banks in droves and competition increased. So the quality of uh, experience was really driven by people being trapped because they couldn't leave. And then it starts up. So you get really good quality. Um, I see this actually a lot is that the businesses that engage in endings are way better businesses because they are passionate about product quality. And if you're looking at products, uh, and the leaving experience is part of that uh, that uh, observation as well. And and better in which sense? Better better companies? Uh, they're just more attentive, I think, to the the consumer experience of their of their their products. So uh, if you look at Netflix um, subscriber or customer satisfaction rates, it's in the eighties, like, and they had a um, easy come and go. They were the first the first sort of streaming service to have a. I'm going to sign up for a month. I'm going to stop it and leave for a month. And then you can do that really easy with Netflix. Now everyone's doing it. It's quite normalized. But that was quite pioneering at the time. And then they're up against, for example, cable companies, which will have really punitive fines for leaving that business. And in terms of the consumer experience, it's pretty similar. I'm sitting down watching telly and I'm consuming that that product. So the... um. The relationships we when, once we get into looking at product experience and the user experience, endings have to be part of that. I'm curious, like, if this is the default mode of operation and it's been going on for quite a long time. There must have been and are strong incentives within businesses to keep this going. What, like, you speak to many people. What, what do you hear? Why are why are they keeping the things the way they are? I, I think historically it was more important. If you think about how a, a good example is um, digital in, across businesses in terms of if we go back 20 years, if you were doing sales, you would manually go to a place, whether that be a business or a, a customer, and you're presenting your customer in a physical way, shops or adverts in magazines and and so the, the whole relationship was very, very different. And as we digitized, people are now, they'll go on, if they want to buy something, go online, and you're getting all sorts of tracking capability to see where they're moving and what they're looking at. And I mean, incredibly detailed. And so we've managed to digitally transform the onboarding experience in amazing ways. And with that, we've lowered the barrier to or we've lowered the engagement of physically and get of, of people physically talking to people it's all all digitized that whole sort of sales funnel is incredibly digitized and so is purchase and and um, distribution and then you come to somebody leaving and we haven't done any effort there in terms of digitizing it um resolving it making it easier and better and part of that is because it's still ever so manual. We Because we don't tend to look at it, and as we've acknowledged earlier, businesses tend to see it as like a problem space, something which to stop, stop people leaving. And really that comes from lack of interest and effort in looking at it and studying it in any sort of meaningful way. So going back to that business risk thing, 
You, mate, I see loads of businesses that have transformed incredibly at onboarding and usage, and I see loads of businesses that are still using offboarding, which could have been delivered in the last sort of hundred years with a telephone. Maybe you can share a few examples that you find inspiring of organizations that have thought about endings, or maybe by <laughs> just doing it by coincidence. But what do you see as examples of good endings? So what, one of the ones I like using is um, Kaya Cars seven year warranty. Now, when they brought that into market, this was going back a few years. It's over 10 years, 12 years old now, Kaya Car seven year warranty. And they put that into a marketplace of warranty periods on cars being two, three years. No one really talked about it as a, you know, a, a really big customer experience. It would be a matter of safety and security. But Kaya Cars comes along, here's a seven year warranty. Now, what's interesting about that from a psychological perspective is humans can only think up to about five years ahead. That's why you get these cliche job interview questions or financial advisor questions. What are you going to be doing in five years' time? But seven years is this like emotional, psychological gap that is really hard to sort of think about. So it's almost like the void, a death-like void. And then dropping that car end of product life into that space says a lot about the psychology of it. Obviously, loads of cars can last way over seven years. I mean, you'll be disappointed if you bought a car nowadays and it only lasts seven years. So 20 years, you'll see loads of other warranty periods more recently, which are 20 years, 30 years. Doesn't really matter. Seven years is that sweet spot. And the sweet spot of human capability to understand project vision and having a place where you're going to come together, resolve issues, and basically have a funeral for that vehicle. So help me understand like a seven year warranty. How is that how is that an end? what's the ending aspect there? The, the consumer thinks about the end being in that seven-year space. So it doesn't really matter if you put a warranty period on longer. The capability of the human is to think into that void-like space. So you're talking about an ending of product purchase. And when you talk about that ending, it sends a lot about reassurance, collaboration, uh, uh, end of product life. And what's happened to Kaya Cars is their their product portfolio, like their global market share doubled over that period. So from like 1.3 to I think 3.2 or something. Um, it also is now considered the best thing about Kaya cars above uh, price point, design, etc. The The end of um, the warranty period, the seven year warranty period is like um, a massive seller. And they're some of the most loyal customers in the business. And is that... Um... So are you saying that by being explicit at the start and during the onboarding about how things are going to end, that that's already like creates huge benefits? It, Absolutely. It, uh -huh. Yeah, that exactly what I'm saying. I, I mean, this is one part of the the engineering stuff is that you got to start talking about endings early on mm. and then... There's a really good quote by, I think, is it Daniel Pink, the sales guru? He says that um, if you show a customer an off-ramp, they're more encouraged to get on the on-ramp in terms of American motorway mm -hmm. metaphors. But you can see how you sort of really study what's the off-ramp, what's the end of this look like. Mm -hmm. You can very much encourage people to come in and in, and because they feel like they're not trapped. That makes absolute sense from psychological perspective i can imagine myself being in that situation i was also thinking like okay so what makes are we avoiding endings and i think endings have um a pretty painful connotation to them like nobody wants to think about divorce nobody wants to think about death nobody wants to think about customer customers leaving so there are there is a pretty heavy emotional load to that. Have you experienced the same? And if so, like, how do we approach that? How do we reframe that? I mean, actually, I think to talk about divorce is an interesting one for, for a moment. Um, if you have, there's two types of divorce that go on in most countries, which are fault divorce, if someone's to blame for this, this divorce happening. 
and no fault divorce where it's an amicable ending and people separate under amicable terms. And, and different countries have different roots. The UK has fault divorce. So you hear some crazy stories of people having to be married still for many years because no one's admitted any fault. And also you then get people who have to admit, admit this sort of fake fault I've been, you know, I've been naughty or I've done this. And, and then they've, they've cheated the system so they can have a divorce earlier. And what's interesting in the US is that some states have fault divorce next to no fault divorce. So you've got right up next to one another these two comparable endings, in a sense. In the, in the, in the um, state that has fault divorce, so someone's to blame, there's a higher incident of um, domestic violence, women being murdered, and all of these other components of problem relationships at home. And um, so I think there, even in that sense, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to start thinking about having good endings, even on divorce level. Makes, again, makes absolute sense. But still, we see that we're not doing that. We're, I don't know if we're actively avoiding thinking about endings. But there, there, this negative load, there, this painful emotion arises pretty quickly when you start thinking about that. Yeah, exactly. And, and part of that is the fear of endings. Like quite naturally, we're, we're scared of death or anyone we love dying. So we don't want to go there. But um, going there is part of the, the softening of that fear. Like any fear, it's a matter of the unknown. It's a matter of uh, thinking the worst. And actually, when you start digging into it with um, sort of a sort of practical f philosophy, whether it be hospices and talking to nurses who work in hos hospices that are looking after end of life, or whether it's people who have had amicable divorces, or whether it's businesses that engage in endings and start to look at it in a more realistic sense. And you start to see that it's not a place to be feared, it's a place to do good work and to do a, a mature level of engagement and um, make the, be the best of that in our, what we're talking about, a service or product experience. So for, for all the, the onboarding and the usage stages, we have uh, pretty uh, sophisticated metrics. Um, and for endings, sort of the only metric that we have is like the churn rate. That that's there is already a negative bias there. When you are doing these workshops, have you found better ways to measure the quality of an ending? Yeah, so there is tools. That, so, for example, Churn Rates and IBM have got quite mature software that analyzes people's behavior on mobile phone networks, for example. So there is companies which are looking at it and they look at it as in a sort of through a fearful lens of, oh my God, a person's going to leave. We've got to do this and that and this. When, so so there's, there's stuff like that there. The, the, the more emotional sort of feedback that you might get from asking a questionnaire of somebody, like, would you recommend this service to someone else? It's sort of been done at the end. Um but it's also about the maturity of the discussion place. So when we look at onboarding and usage, we the tools, the sophistication, the, the type of approaches that we have, incredibly diverse and nuanced to create a product and create desire in that product. And when we look at the end, it's very binary because we've not very much looked at it and we haven't analysed it. So in all the work that I've been doing, it's essentially about building vocabulary, tools, and capability for people to analyze that space in a more mature and sophisticated way. But the trouble is, is that we look at it as a binary place, like this person's a customer, now they're not a customer. And that becomes incredibly scary, binary. And like you say, we just looked at it through the bottom line. And are there better ways? Yeah, so I, I think certainly, Putting, uh, looking at the end. So what I say to everyone in when when I get asked, what's the one thing you can say to people? Just ask at your next product meeting, whether it's a service, digital or physical product, how does this end? And you will see a paralyzing approach in your in your product meetings. 
and because we don't look at it so often, we start to people don't understand why we're asking the question. So it's an incredibly wide open field of opportunity to innovate. So just from that one question, it's then let's start to look. And then you start looking and you can start analyzing and observing and gaining insights like we would with other problem spaces we'd have in other sort of service um, innovation and development. We'd look, we'd observe, we'd gather insights, we'd test that. And then and then I've built loads of tools and models that you can get started with to start looking at that space in terms of the stages of offboarding or the types of endings in terms of the characteristics that um, humans are experiencing at the end of product life. So th these are sort of things that help companies get started with looking at that. Could we take a practical example and just improvise a little bit here? Let's take a service and I'm going to be selfish and let's take, for instance, the Circle community for in-house service design professionals, which I've been hosting. Um, there has been a lot of thought about the onboarding, the uh, sort of the acquisition part, the usage part. Would you be able to walk us through the typical steps that we do to design endings around a service like this? For sure. So it's essentially a membership service, I think. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not in it, so I mean, I'm going to spitball here for a bit. You've got a membership service that has, uh, I mean, if it's going well, and I think it does, because you wouldn't get to 207 episodes if it wasn't, and uh, a loyal uh, sort of following. So I think there's a, a lot of positive loyalty in that. But sometimes people move on because they have different interests. Uh, they might move on to monetary reasons. So it's a good idea to like, why are you leaving? What have you got out of it? So definitely like understanding why people leave is is really good. And then like in the aftermath, there's a lot of examples of how we need to sort of sort of feel like a distant part of that community, yet not maybe in it in, um, entirely. So you're not inside the circle, let's say, you're outside the circle. What does that mean? And I think there's a, a lot for the consumer of that, of, of value, which they are honoured to have done and they feel... Uh, loyal to it but they're not just inside the circle and and so you can really start to draw out like why this person has left so the characteristics of types of endings that they might have left for and how have they left so what's the process of them leaving is it a see you later and we count the subscription which is the approach of many things but it should be probably if you look into more personal societal endings so they're often gatherings so whether it be a funeral or e even um, a marriage is the end of a single person's life so you're doing a transition point and a lot of these are gatherings they're reflections so what's the reflection moment at something like a membership and then there's another dimension which is not in but out or past and we see that uh, through alumni schemes there's lots of alumni schemes all around the world from all sorts of different places whether usually they come from education but you see them from businesses now and i even see there's ones from prisons as well so these are, are groupings of people who've uh, had a experience together in a sort of social in a social grouping. So it's essentially quite often their services. So um, education is a good example. Um, education industry is now looking at those networks. And so, so are sort of places like consultancy, seeing them as incredible networks to draw upon for increased sales or educational or actually re-employment as well. So these um, all have relationships in terms of endings and what that stretch is like over, over sort of... Um, you know, m many, maybe years, months, weeks, or whatever. This, <clears throat> our pre-chat also inspired me already to think a little bit about this. And you mentioned education. Yeah. And, and I was applying that way of thinking around the circle. And it's really interesting when you start to look at the member life cycle from different perspectives. So yes, there is a stage where somebody is paying, is a paying member. You could also say that once they stop paying, they are still a member, but have a different status. And maybe uh, that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. And I think those are sort of exciting things to start designing for. So, I mean, they're like, for the circle metaphor, these would be lower and lower ripples as they as they stretched out over time and maybe distance. And maybe these people have um, equity, emotional equity in the circle going on. And maybe they've got physical assets. Maybe there was books, maybe there was recordings or, you know, they had privilege at one point. And and I, I think about that sort of um that those sort of things where you have left a club, a membership, whether it be work, and then the way you go back to work that is, oh, how are you doing? Smiling faces. You're not working there anymore, but you're getting the benefits of social engagement. And and so there's loads of stuff to think about in terms of that offboarding and ending and and living in the post and post post experience. So when we apply this way of thinking and saying, okay, somebody, and let's keep with the circle, somebody, quote unquote, graduates and doesn't churn, is there actually an ending? Because like, you've been part of this community, you've been part of this service, and you 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 never leave. You just get another a different um, stage. I think. That gets asked a lot. I think I'm very passionate about believing everything ends. We have a decaying relationship with everything that we do in life, whether that be our health or our, you know, eyes or or marriages end in one of two ways, death or divorce. So I think we have to consider different modes and as things fade, uh people have different roles in whether it be employment or monetary to pay for membership and and so they'll they'll want to move on as well and i think if you for any business if you aren't thinking about your business transitioning into another mode i think you're crazy because the whether it be through digital or technology changes or societal changes or you know there were some really horrible membership clubs years ago or there was very dated relationships with um, different groups years ago that the sort of membership component has to change the, you know, it was uh, magazine subscriptions was a good membership club for many years. I mean, that's died its death a, a lot. And uh, so there's, there's lots of things which are very different, I think, now. And in this case, how we, what, what, what are... <laughs> What stage are we actually designing? So is it like being an active member versus being an alumni? Are we designing the being the alumni part of are we designing the transition between moving between two stages? Is is that the quote unquote dying or ending yeah, I, phase? So, yes. So if you are moving from the um, a membership state, full membership to uh, alumni state, that's a transition and essentially an ending of that that membership state. And I think with an alumni state, you can you can look at that through a number of different lenses. Whether it be I'm going to be a passive alumni, with, and I'm going to take that to the grave that that's that status of mm-hmm. I used to do this and now I don't can can live. It's neutralized of any activity. And I think that's the destination point is that this is a memory. This is a, a experience that happened in the past. And hopefully we should be designing for good memories. Uh-huh. And if we don't look at endings, we can't create the sort of solid foundations for a good memory to live on for inter- eternity. It's it's so fascinating because with endings, at least my initial response is uh, it goes to towards um, the financial transaction area. But of course, it's not. It's much it, you can apply this way of thinking to even the onboarding stage where you say, OK, you've made it through your first hundred days. And now we have a ritual in place, a ceremony to celebrate that you're moving away. You're ending your being a junior and graduating into becoming a full member. So endings, I can imagine, can also be like in many different parts of the journey. Absolutely. You can get um, a good example is how uh, brand, the sort of brand, the brand um, 
attributes that businesses like to talk about. So we're really tr transparent. We're really honest. We're brave. And businesses and talk about their brand in those senses, which is incredibly moronic on some levels. However, but what set, tends to happen is that it only happens at onboarding and usage. So when you look at the end, they will use um, manipulating techniques, dark patterns. Uh, they will do all sorts of manipulating things to halt, change, and they'll they can't be proud of that relationship that they're having with themselves at the end in terms of brand equity. So looking at how you can almost all the attention of a, in a very simplistic sense, all the attention and the stages that you have are onboarding. How does that get mirrored to offboarding? And then you start asking, my God, we don't do any of the stuff at offboarding that we are proud of at onboarding. There's so much emphasis on the sales aspect and f we discussed this like it only matters as long as you're paying but of course that's that's stupid that's silly and uh there's so much opportunity in endings in every stage of the journey like again i think for me what works for me is really the graduating uh metaphor and where you see your customers and members graduating through different stages of the life cycle and at some point, yes, they are paying for something, for your service, for your product, but the other stages matter as well. I, I would say that because it's so uncomfortable to talk about endings, we don't spend enough time wallowing and feeling in that point. I, I guarantee you, you've probably thought about the graduating experience a load, the onboarding experience load, but the it's just a matter of, and I, I say this to a lot of people when I do the training program is that, well, slow down a bit. Stop thinking about endings as being in other parts of the business. You've done all of that. You're really good at thinking about how onboarding and usage periods happen. Just sit there and think about the end for a bit and, and try really hard not to think of it as the next sales cycle or mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. transition point. These have the end has different characteristics that need to be considered in the in in the sort of um, the respectful way that we do it onboarding and usage periods. So, what would be those characteristics that are different? Well, I, I think for one thing, we're not in an in a, a growing period of like acquiring money. It's a it's a different type of relationship which you've had with a customer that's been respectful, loyal to that business. And that you're saying goodbye to them, you're not acquiring money off them. So the the type of relationship's entirely different, and so it should be about reflection. It should be about um, um, like reclaiming um, materials or doing reverse logistics in services. It should be about um, bringing uh, like the right appropriate sort of end note to that service as well. A good example of that is in um, healthcare where. For the onboarding period, there's a lot of engagement between patient and um, consultant, and or, or the the healthcare service, and you'll have a lot of discussion about what's going to happen, what sort of state you're in, what sort of um, disease or problem you have. You'll go through, and there'll be loads of gates. There'll be loads of conversations that have cared for, and and then you'll have the procedure, and then. There, or it may be many procedures. And then you'll be told like, well, that's job done. And then it'll be sort of see you later. And that, that's that been going on for years. There's a, a good quote I heard about it was like, there's no balloons at the uh, at the um, passing or beating cancer. But the there has been now um, groups that have done things like end of treatment bells, which is an incredibly poignant thing. And that came out of the children's, um, the children's sort of wards where these kids would go in for these incredibly traumatic experiences and then be sort of emotionally uh, abandoned almost at the end until you can get this end of treatment bell that punctuates the end and has a far more, um, it, it, it sort of finalises the, the trauma that they've gone through and, and gives an end to it. So, so even in things like healthcare, there's a there's lots of work that can be done. Yes, yeah, and like you said, when you look at this a bit closer from 
a business perspective and a human perspective, the end is also a very important moment to show that you just care. And that's maybe the problem. I don't know if most businesses actually care. Uh, I care for the people who I work with, uh, whether or not they are paying. And the way you do endings, I think, reflects that or not. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, it, you can say a lot about the way that you end something. So in there's a whole chapter in the book about the psychology of endings and how important it is to lay down good memories, the methodology of doing that. Um, we basically build a lot of memories into usage. It's only 50% and half of those memories are laid down in inclusion and endings. So that uh, that's peak end rule by Daniel yes. Payman, but... There's lots of other um, there's lots of other psychological traits that support that type of work in terms of how memory gets recalled in terms of good experiences or bad experiences. So there's there's stacks around it which we're not looking at in terms of um, creating good consumer offboarding experiences. And when you mentioned the peak end rule, like that's that's such an old brain and that's such a classic uh, example. And thinking about the ending um, as a peak, like <laughs> would almost be like, how can you make that even the best experience of the entire journey? It would be really interesting. And um, I'm trying to project this and it, we're going to do an exercise together probably to actually design this for the circle. But there are so many good ways to end the relationship with existing members and celebrate uh, them being part of the community up till that point, you can, like you said, try to design for the remembering self, um, try to, uh, sort of keep them part of like honor them, uh, honor the fact that they've spent time, attention, contributed to the community, make them make a public list of alumni. Um, yeah, there, I see so many ways and that's, you might think be questioning like okay so why would you invest in that but i can totally see that having good relationships with quote unquote former customers um that's going to pay dividends in and how they the community. left how they left left will um give them the sort of value of like re-engaging as well so 100 uh, you yeah. know if you if first i had a really good um experience with uh an old a, a previous person who graduated through doing the engineering course and he was um a marketing in this marketing company and one of their clients quite a big client said okay we're going to give this um this contract to someone else and he said right i'm going to try out this endings thing see if it works and so he just spent loads of effort making the best ending so uh packaging everything up really neatly giving them some sort of like little celebration and coming to back to the studio to you know overly praise them and thank them for all the stuff that they've done and they were blown away by this experience and so although they lost that account this company came back to them with this bigger account and gave the, this bigger account to them because they they'd laid down good memories they controlled that offboarding and they built even more trust at the end to say we're really good at all of this part and we're not just going to walk away from you because you stopped paying for us but um yeah i th i thought that was a really good approach to it to and a, a proof of the concept as it were i would love to see numbers and we are i'm i'm going to get those numbers that how many referrals are you getting from your former customers like i think that's a very interesting metric for how well you've designed not just the usage aspect, because if you screw up there, even even if you screw up there, I think the ending can make or break, like people referring or coming back to your business. Y yeah, for sure. I mean, you can some bad businesses. You hear really commonly bad bad stories about them. I think some of the, a lot of the data, especially in services, is skewed towards monopolies as well. So, it, for example, leaving an electricity business or a water company that sometimes there's no other options. You've only got one or two in the area, so it's really difficult. Uh, but a good example um, I found and wrote about in the first book is gyms. The, the industry's changed a bit since 2017, but 
essentially gyms do entrapment. They'll trap you in for 12 months and give pretty punitive fines. Back then, that was what was happening. And so people would have absolutely awful experiences at gyms and trying to leave them. And if you take that and say, okay, I've left this gym, I've gone to this other gym now, and now I've had another bad experience of leaving this other gym, and now I've gone to a third gym, and this third gym does just really good leaving experiences because what people don't have the insight about and such the repulsion of endings is they don't look at that as a, a competitive advantage. In the gym industry, a lot of people go to the gym regularly and happy, but a load of people go to gyms and leave gyms. That's what they do. They sign up and leave a gym. If you're the only gym in the area which has a good leaving experience, you're going to be there for the best gym in the area. This was also, and thank you for sharing this, but this was also like a light bulb moment for me that over time, if you stay in business long enough, you'll have, you'll always have more customers that have left you than you have active customers. Yeah. So again, coming back just because it's practical to the circle community, we are probably getting very close to having more quote unquote alumni versus active members. And there is a cap on how many active members we can and want to have, but there is no cap on the number of alumni. So only just from that perspective, it makes sense to be very mindful and deliberate about what you do with your alumni. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, I mean, in a crude different way, look at Facebook, how it's probably not growing anymore and it's on the, on the decline, but they do memorial pages. Um, even if you're signing up now as a, the youngest member to sign up 14, you've got on average 67 years, I think, life expectancy for the for globe is. So you're looking at Facebook dying under the weight of memorial pages as people leave Facebook who are alive and more mem- more people there being dead. So around 2,100 or something, maybe less, 2,080, is it? Probably something around there where Facebook will end under the weight of memorial pages. Because I've done some research into it and there's no way a memorial page ends. A lot of uh, Google, Facebook took them seven years to realize human beings died created memorial pages and systems of um, seeing how people died and leaving the system. And now they create memorial pages, but there's no reason the memorial pages end through lack of um, visits, through um, all all sorts of other reasons. And so once again, we fail to consider the ending of everything. So interesting. Um, You've written two books by now and Usually my experience, when you start writing and formalize your thoughts, you often end up with more questions than you started with, better questions often than you started with. What are some questions around endings that are on your mind right now? Um, So I totally agree with that. The first book gave me a foundation and it was about answering loads of questions that I just had no idea about. So from that point, I then had uh, I built a background and a foundation to build a vocabulary. And then the second book is really about building and extending that vocabulary to sort of practical tools and thoughts about endings. The questions I have now, uh, and because it's a moving space, it becomes really complicated. So you can look into history, and the, the first book does a lot of history, societal, psychological stuff that stays stable for a long time. But going forward in terms of designing and helping businesses design endings, the landscape is very unstable. Um, and that's unstable in terms of um, material matter, um, different relationships with carbon, uh, changes in political views, um, all, all sorts of these things really affect and impact how somebody might leave your business and for what reasons. And it also impacts the the dimension of what are we doing to neutralize. So th- that's my the end point for any of these engagements is to neutralize the negative consequences of that engagement. And that can be anything from 
lingering digital assets to um, monetary things and services being and subscriptions being unpaid or like it can be in physical products lingering carbon or plastic or something like that but it doesn't mean that we delete the emotional positive experiences so that's that space is quite complicated and constantly moving so whether it be through social norms uh, material capability or digital and technological changes so it's a moving space, but I think laying foundations historically uh, and building on the the previous two books, it, you can start to sort of use tools to work out the best method to design for that thing. What's um, what's the third book going to be about? Mm, I now need to dig into particular sectors, and I am half halfway between writing a book about ends in digital experiences and how that works and how we design for that or around sustainability or around reverse logistics so there's a number of thoughts i have about what books i'm going to write so um some of them are more mature than others and i always i'm always writing so i've had i've been thinking about all sorts of different things some of the stuff's on the blog and Loads of stuff isn't, but um, thinking about different different things and what's going on. But how do I help society and industry work better with endings and improve consumer offboarding to improve the damages of consumerism? Then I think maybe some of the best places is to probably work with, um, you know, yeah. So I don't I don't know yet. <laughs> That's the answer, but. I, I think I'm going to write another book. I mean, I was wondering about doing a film. I've done the training programs in the past and and work with businesses like more projects based stuff. So the next project is maybe a book. Books are good, actually. They linger a lot in the world. Speaking about books, um, we have designed the ending of our conversation uh, on a high note uh, using the peak end rule and the book thing that we're going to do right now is announce a giveaway so for all of uh, you who have made it uh to this point in our conversation you'll have the opportunity to win a signed copy of Co one copies of the copies we can send both of them yeah uh, yes um so um what do our listeners need to do in order to make uh, a chance to win a signed copy so I'd done a TED talk a few years ago. And so what month and year was that TED talk done in? Leave a comment either on the YouTube video, if you're watching the video version or uh, in Spotify, uh, you can leave a comment there as well. If you're listening on a different platform, go to the YouTube video and leave a comment there. That's usually the best way. And I'll make sure that the links are in there. Speaking about links, uh, Joe, in case someone wants to learn more about your work, uh, what's the best place they can visit? The best place is the website, and that is simply www.andend.co. So, andend.co. Yes, that's a pretty tricky URL actually to, to write once you see it. Seeing it, it's, uh, it makes sense, but I'll also make sure that that one and, is. And it's dot yep. .co because dot .com, I think no one thinks about ending, so I removed the M, and that's why I remember it as dot .co. I hope you have both. Um, yeah. Last question. Um, speaking about remembering and endings, what do you hope someone will remember from our conversation today? I hope they're going to go back to work and then go... How does our product end, be it a service, digital, or physical product? That's a great question to end upon. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, I hope our, continue, our conversation doesn't end here and will continue uh, for a longer time. But for this episode, this is it. Thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you very much, Mark, and really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. I took so many things away from the conversation with Joe. There are many reasons why someone will stop using your service. But you can actually celebrate customers leaving your business. Offboarding isn't always the same as breaking up. Your customers can graduate 
and still stay connected. The relationship that you have invested in and have built up doesn't need to be broken, which is how most businesses operate today. So there is a huge opportunity for anyone who wants to stand out from the crowd. All these ideas got me really excited to start applying these principles onto my own circle community. Because I feel that members who leave our community can become our best ambassadors. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. No, not to feed a YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, as always, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontijn, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.